Okay, we have considered the historical simulation approach. The other one, as I was telling you before, is the model building. In the, in the model building approach, essentially, uh, we are assuming a model for the joint variations of the different market variables. Okay, so we have a model that tells us how we can expect the prices, the volatilities, the, the rates to change jointly. So it's by definition a multivariate model. Now within the model building family, there are several possibilities that can be used, but the most used and abused one is the VAR covariance approach. So it's nothing more than a generalization of the simple linear normality assumption that we have seen uh, so far. The fact that it's a model building approach, again, tells us that we are assuming a model, but the parameters of this model are actually computed and estimated using actual data. So every bank will have uh, its own parameters. Um, as I already told you, the typical assumption is assumption of normality. Again, if normality is a very strong assumption at the unit variate level, so when you just consider, for example, one price, one interest rate, whatever, when you put them together in a multivariate framework, it's even more dangerous. Because in the multivariate framework, normality essentially never exists unless you are creating an artificial, an artificial world. If you really want to use it, it can still be acceptable, yet wrong, but the error not so dramatic. If your portfolio is granular, and granularity of a portfolio is one of the requirements of Basel, granular means that your portfolio is large, so different assets, many assets belong to your portfolio, and well diversified. So for example, a monotonic portfolio will not be granular. So you have a portfolio that is diversified, such that you have assets that may move in one direction, but they are compensated by assets moving in the other direction. And typically you should have a portfolio, but then you see why it will not work, that only contains stocks, bonds, and linear products on stock and bonds. But we know by definition that this is not true because all banks will have options, all banks will have credit risk derivatives that are not linear. So as soon as you move away from linearity of products, then and you have no linearity, then normality does not work but still it is used, can be overcome using different techniques like copulas, but also there it's funny because they move away from the normal assumption, but then you use the, the Gaussian copula. So it's like you throw away normality out of the door and it enters from the window. So it's, it's always the same. Now, just very quick uh, recap. We know that in our basic framework, if we assume the normal distribution, the value at risk is the, the quantity. So the value at risk at level alpha is equal to mu plus sigma, the quantile function of a standard normal computed at the alpha level. Now, if we make the further assumption that on a daily basis, remember that we are playing with market risk, and I told you that the daily time horizon is the standard. If we assume that on a daily basis, mu, so the average, is zero, what remains is just sigma, the quantile function of the standard normal computed in alpha. Is it plausible to assume an average, for example, return of zero for a very short time horizon, yes. For example, take a yearly return of 20%. If you take this yearly return on a, of 20% and you spread it over the entire year using a commercial year, it means that is more or less 0.08%. So we can take it at 
we can say that this quantity is close enough to zero to be set to zero. But this is only true for very short time horizon. One day, we can take it to be short enough. So this is our valid risk. It's sigma, the quantile function of a standard normal computed in alpha fine. For example, if this is the var in the model building approach that you're using to compute your capital requirement, this is the var that you will input in the formula that you have seen before. Instead of the var computed on the actual loss distribution as generated by the historical simulation, this is the var that you can, that you can compute assuming normality. You take this value and you put that in, in the formula. If this is the case, here you see even more why during a crisis you have procyclicality, because sigma appears explicitly there. So if sigma increases, the valid risk increases, capital requirement increases, you have to liquidate your asset, sigma increases, and so on. So you enter in the loop. So here it's particular evident. Now, if you have two assets and you put them together, how do you compute the valid risk of this very simple portfolio? In a very simple way. So if I have two assets, the two assets will have their own volatilities, sigma x and sigma y, if x is the first asset and y is the second asset. And if I want to compute the volatility of the portfolio, will be the square root of the variance of the first asset plus the variance of the second asset plus two times the correlation between the two assets times the product of their standard deviations. So the usual formula. Once I have computed the standard deviation, hence the volatility of my portfolio, the formula again is the same. So I just substitute the previous sigma with the sigma of the portfolio. So it's very, very simple. Since I know that volatility sigma is a coherent risk measure, so it's subadditive, already here, I should see why, so think about that, the valid risk is coherent under normality, because it is subadditive. You exploit the subadditivity of the standard deviation. So assume that we have 10 million of Microsoft shares and 5 million of AT&T. We know that the daily volatilities are 2% and 1% for the two uh, for the two stocks, and the correlation that has been computed is 0.3, which is already a high level of correlation on the market. You will never see on the market unless you create very strange compositions, a correlation of 1 or minus 1. 0.3 is already a substantial quantity. What's the 95% valid risk of the portfolio under the normality assumption? So if we assume that the daily changes are normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation equal to sigma, which are 2% daily, 1% daily, and I build a portfolio, what's the 95% valid risk? Now, what I have to do? The first thing to do is to change, to transform the daily uh, the daily percentage variation into absolute variation. So the 2% of my $10 million uh, is the 2% of $10 million, which is 200000 And for at and I will take the 1% of $5 million, so 50000 These are my volatilities expressed in absolute terms. Then I compute nothing more than the volatility of the portfolio using the formula that we have seen. So uh, 200,000 squared, because that's the variance, plus 50,000 squared, again the variance of the TNT, plus two times the correlation, 0 0.3 times the standard deviations. This value, take the square root, is 220,227. Now, I want to compute the 95% valid risk, so I multiply that value by the corresponding quantile of a standard normal distribution at the 95% confidence level. 
that level using the tables of the standard normal or your software or recalling that number just by heart it's 1.6448 or if you want it's one, uh, uh, six, five if you want to approximate you multiply and you get that the daily var for this very small portfolio is 300 something thousand okay so it's extremely extremely simple now the var of the 95% the value risk of the portfolio that we have just computed is 362,000 and blah, blah, blah. If you compute the bars of the single assets, so of Microsoft and AT&T, these values are 300, uh, 328,000 and blah, 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 and 82,000 for AT&T. If you sum them together, you get that the sum of the bars is more than 400,000. And interestingly, if you compare this value with the var of the portfolio. So if you compute, if you compute, if you compare, sorry, the sum of the bars of the assets with the var of the portfolio, you see that in this case, valid risk is subadditive. Why? Because we are under normality and everything again comes. It's a nice exercise to try to solve, to think about that that everything comes from the fact that we are using the subadditivity of the standard deviation of the portfolio. Because we know that by definition, sigma t will be smaller than or equal to sigma x, sigma y, where x and y are Microsoft and AT&T. Since we have this formula, if I substitute here something which is smaller than the sum of these and the other one, in the portfolio, you can easily see that the valid risk is subadditive. Again, under normality, not in general. The, the classical question is, is the valid risk subadditive? Question, answer, not in general. It is subadditive under normality, yes. Okay, if you take the difference between the valid risk of the portfolio and the sum of the valid risks, you get a quantity that is positive by definition, and this is what is called the impact of diversification. So it shows you why subadditivity is, is it's useful when it holds, because it's, it shows you that the total risk of building a portfolio like this is going down with respect to considering just the different assets. So combining our portfolio generates a total risk which is lower than the sum of the risks. So that's what diversification is. Again, and then I stop repeating, uh, repeating that, it is true for the valid risk only because of normality. If, on the contrary, I would ask you to compute the expected shortfall in this framework, you will see that the expected shortfall will always be coherent because the expected shortfall is always coherent. It does not require normality to be coherent. It works in general. Now, if I have an assets, how does it go? If I have an assets, I just generalize the formula from two assets to three assets, four assets, five assets, and so on, up to n. So the change in the portfolio will be just the combination of the changes in the different assets weighted by the weight of the different assets in my portfolio. And if I want, if I call, for example, the weight of asset I in my portfolio as alpha I, if I want to compute the variance of my portfolio, it will be just the double sum of the correlation between asset I and asset J times alpha i, the weight of asset i, alpha j, the weight of asset j, times the product of their standard deviations, that is to say, their volatilities. You see that in the specific case in which, for example, i is equal to j, the correlation is necessarily one, so it disappears. Alpha i, alpha j becomes alpha i squared, 
and sigma i sigma j is sigma i squared so i have directly the variance of the height asset and since of the height asset i have alpha i weight i will take alpha i square the variance because remember that if i have x and i compute the variance of x and then i multiply x by a constant, the variance of alpha x is equal to alpha squared, the variance of x. Okay, so I put everything together here by hand. It can be a boring observation, uh, oh, sorry, it can be a boring computation with your computer is something that you do. In nanoseconds, you get the, uh, the variance, you compute the square root and you get the sigma that you will put here to get the valid risk of your portfolio. So you see why they like this approach so much, because this approach is extremely simple and quick. Now, one thing, if you want to write everything in a more condensed and mathematically preferable way, what you can do is, we know that correlation is equal to the covariance between x and y divided by the product of their standard deviations. If I rearrange the terms, I can, all, I can always write the covariance between asset i and asset j as the product of their standard deviations times their correlation. If I do that and I substitute that covariance in the previous formula that we have seen, I can rewrite the variance of the portfolio in this way. So it's the double sum in i and j of the covariance between asset i and asset j times the product of their weights. This representation, if you are a little bit familiar, you remember a little bit of the linear algebra you had in previous courses and so on, can be easily represented in a quadratic form uh, in linear algebra, which is alpha transpose C, where C is the variance covariance matrix, that is to say the matrix that contains all the information about the variances on the main diagonal and the covariances on all the other positions, times again, a so this is the condensed form and this is why this approach is called the variance covariance approach because it is just it is just it okay this is for example what we do in the model building approach if we want to play with returns and prices but we know that our portfolio can be obviously influenced by other quantities like interest rates, like volatility, and so on. Now, for volatility, it is extremely simple. Why? Because obviously I can change here my estimates of the volatility according to the model I have. A Garch model, an Arch model, an historical model, and I will necessarily get my valid risk. But what happens, for example, if I'm here, if I'm interested in interest rates. Assume that I have my portfolio. My portfolio, if I am a large bank, necessarily with probability one, will contain <laughs> assets that are linked to interest rates. So understand the movements of the yield curve becomes fundamental for me and fundamental to understand how the value risk will change accordingly. Now, to simplify, we'll make the same assumption that we made when we will start in duration and convexity. So we will assume that when we consider the yield curve, there is only a parallel shift. So this is my yield curve, and it's just translated up or down. But the distance is constant. In reality, you can have non-parallel shift. That is to say, just one point increases or decreases but we ignore that. If this is the case, and if you don't remember that, you go back and check what we said about duration, I can define the variation in my portfolio, delta P, as minus the duration of the portfolio, and the duration of the portfolio, you would see if you 
refresh a little bit what we said about duration. It's nothing more than the weighted average of the durations of the different assets. It's minus the duration of the portfolio times the value of the portfolio times the variation delta y in the yield. Y is our yield. Now this is our duration approximation. Now, Let's see how we can immediately apply that in our framework under the model building approach. Again, we are always in the model building approach in which normality is all we care about. We have 8 million euros in bonds, okay? And the duration of our portfolio, so we have maybe bonds from Germany, we have bonds from France, from the Netherlands, then we have bonds issued by some company. Altogether, computing the different duration and taking the weighted average, I have a duration of 3.5 years in my portfolio. It means that on average, I have to wait three, I have to wait for 3.5 years in order to see payments. Okay, that's the meaning of duration. Assume that there is a parallel shift in the yield curve and that the standard deviation of the daily yield decreases by 0.04%. The question is, what is the one day 95% valid risk? Or what is the one day 99% valid risk? I will just have to change 1.64 with something else, but nothing particular. Now, if I take the duration relationship, what do I have? I know that the change in my portfolio is given by minus d times p times the variation. Now, the variation that we are observing, delta y for us, is a decrease of 4%. So it's 0.04%, uh, sorry. So it's minus 0.04. So that minus deletes the minus that we have in the duration relationship, okay? So that's why the minus disappears. The duration is 3.5, 3.5 there. I have the value of the portfolio P, which is 8 million, 8 million. The change of Y, which is 0.0004. And I multiply this by the quantile function of my standard normal. At the 95% level, it's 1.645. And the value that I get for my daily valid risk at the 95% confidence level is 18,000 something. So what you see is that we are using the duration relationship to get an estimate of the change in our portfolio given interest rates, which is nothing more than a proxy of this volatility. So it's the volatility used in the portfolio by the change in the yield, okay? So another very simple thing. How can we use the Greeks? In a very similar way. Now here, sorry, it's not my fault. So at least I can be responsible for many other things. It's just a matter of notation. I try to be consistent with Hull, and I don't like it, but uh, not to create too much confusion. Just notice that when it is alone, delta is delta. So is the delta Greek is the sensitivity of our portfolio to small changes in the price of the underlying asset. <laughs> when it is close to something, so if I write delta S as the variation in S, is S minus ST minus ST minus one, okay? Just to not, just to help you reading, I always put the explicit times to separate the, the two things. So if you don't see that, it means it's the variation. So delta P over delta S is the variation. When it is alone, it's the delta, it's the Greek. So the Greek delta, we know is delta P, the variation in the value of the portfolio, over delta S, the variation in the price or the value of the underlying asset. If I rearrange, I can write that the variation in the portfolio is delta times delta S. Okay, so it's delta times the variation in the price. Now, let's assume that delta x is the return on the given stock that we are considering on a daily basis. So I can write delta s as s times 
delta x. So it's the value, for example, yes, the times the daily variation that we have observed, which is delta x. So I can rewrite my delta p as s times the Greek delta times the daily variation in the value of the offset. So I have a very simple linear relationship between the variation in the portfolio, delta p, and the daily variation in the asset, delta x. If I have a certain number of assets in my portfolio, what I will have is that delta p will be nothing more than the linear combination of all these variations. If I use this linear approximation for all the variations in my portfolio, what I'm using is the so-called linear model. You remember when we were considering the Greeks, we have seen delta, gamma, giga, rho, theta, and at a certain point, we were making the distinction about the situations in which we can just use delta to delta hedge a portfolio of linear products, in which gamma by definition is zero, and the more general situation in which our portfolio contains no linear products so that gamma is not zero and should not be ignored. This is exactly the same situation. If our portfolio only contains stock bonds and linear products, the linear model is all you need to have and all you need to do to, to deal with risk decently under the normality assumption. <coughs> If your portfolio contains options, you will find in a very small section in the book by Hal that we can generalize the linear model to the nonlinear model. We don't cover the details, so it's not particularly relevant to us. But the reason is given by the fact that there is a gamma that we cannot ignore. So this is what we call the linear model. We take the variation in the portfolio and as the linear combination of the variations of the different assets. Let's consider again a simple example. We have our portfolio of options on Microsoft and t, &T. Assume that the delta of Microsoft is 1,000 and the delta of at t is 2, uh, 20,000. Sorry. Then we know that the value of Microsoft is 120 and the value of at t is 30. And what we want to compute is the variation in the portfolio. Using the linear model, we have just to take 120, the, the, the value of Microsoft, times the corresponding Greek, which is 1000, times the variation that we call delta x, plus 30, the value of at t times their Greek, delta, which is 20,000, times delta y. OK, let's go on. Assume that all the other data that we need are exactly the same that we have been using for the other exercises in this, in this lesson. What I have to compute is this, using the information about the changes of the portfolio. OK, then this is very simple. Because if I want to compute everything, I have all the data. Remember, the volatility of Microsoft was uh, 2%. The one of the daily volatility was 2% in the percentage, 1% uh, for uh, at and So what I have is this. I take 120 <laughs> times 0 0.02 squared plus 600 times 0.01 squared plus all the other quantities, I just stack them together and I take their product. What I get, I need to take the square root is a 7.099 and what I have to compute is the 95 again, 95% relative risk, 1.6448 times d squared. That would be my relative risk if I want to use the linear model that relies on the delta Greek in order to approximate the variation of the portfolio. If I want to be more sophisticated, I can introduce the gamma and deal with the so-called problem of linearity. <laughs>
we know that not all pro no portfolios are linear. Essentially, no portfolio is linear unless I explicitly build that. I can introduce gamma. It will be a formula very similar to this one with the second order term in gamma, as we did in the unit varied case. It's exactly the same stuff, but now we have more assets. The computation is just more involved because you have to, more terms to take into consideration. But that's very, very simple. Okay, so that is what I want you to know about market risk. Historical model building. In the model building, we have just considered, but it's not the only one, the approach that assumes normality everywhere. It has been relaxed in the literature. So if you take scientific papers in mathematical finance, you, you find very absurd and fascinating and complex construction, but in practice, they are totally ignored and they either use these, which is extremely simple, or the Gaussian copula that is also known as the Lee model, 